Hi, and welcome to today's uh, episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu and I'm Horia. And we'd love to welcome Scott Ambler today to The Focus podcast. Welcome, Scott. So, hi. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Very good. So, um, for those of you that wonder, uh, that doesn't know Scott, we'll we'll get into that. But Scott is quite uh, uh, a, a tour de force in in the world of agility, and he's got a lot of experience. But we've actually, why why did we invite Scott here? Is that first of all, he's one of the he is the creator of Discipline Agile, and I've met him through my journey uh, working with Discipline Agile as far back as about seven or eight years ago. Um, that I've met Scott, and we've um, we've we've had interaction, but it really got uh, the interaction and the working together with Scott on the DI stuff was uh, when I joined the um, advisory council for Discipline Agile, as well as Scott's latest book. I uh, they they invited me to participate as um, in writing the book with them or. Uh, we, I think we are called us reviewers, and um, I know that uh, I made his, I, I made him scratch his head on a few occasions on some of the feedback uh, on the book. Um, Scott's also got quite a lot of delivery experience, um, so uh, the uh, the battle scores uh, makes him a really good candidate to come and talk to us about adaptive oversight. And we've also uh, were quite uh, a privilege to have Scott part of our original adaptive oversight research that we conducted uh, in 2020. Now life's moved on a little bit since then, but we'll we'll get into that a little bit later. I'm going to ask Scott to just share a little bit of his background and experience, his river of life. Yeah, definitely. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be here. So um, just a, a bit of my background. So I, excuse me, I earned my degree in uh, computer science, I guess, in the late 80s. And uh, so started my career in the financial space. Uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada. So you, you pretty much can't live in, in Toronto without working for the, the big banks at some point. And uh, so I, you know, worked for, uh, you know, a bank and a reinsurance company and and had a pretty good time in the IT space where um, a lot of my effort was around data oriented uh, things. Uh, I was basically doing data warehouse and BI work uh, long before those terms were even around. Um, but then I left and I uh, went back to school, got my master's degree on a part-time basis and uh, worked in the object oriented space uh, for several years. Uh, Cause this was, uh, you know, it was hot. Uh, one of the reasons why I left the banks was because I believed in um, opportunity technology and that was made pretty clear to me that it would never take off and all that good sort of stuff. So I, uh, I, I left for, uh, for better things and I worked in the e-commerce space for, uh, for several years as well, you know, in the Silicon Valley days. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, did a lot of work in uh, the traditional space uh, as well as in UML and good things like that. And then in the late nineties, I became disenchanted with, traditional serial heavyweight ways of working. Um, it was wonderful theory, but it just didn't work well. And uh, so anyways, I uh, started experimenting with more streamlined ways of working. And that was the point where the agile movement uh, started out. And I knew most of the people that uh, wrote the original manifesto had uh, worked with a couple of them uh, and, and certainly interacted with, the, with most of them um, at conferences and events and stuff like that. And um, one of the things I did very early on was I led the development of what became Agile Modeling. And we were originally trying to answer the question, how do you approach modeling on an extreme programming project? And then that evolved a bit into uh, what became a more robust technique called Agile Modeling. And at the same time, uh, well, almost immediately after, I developed, uh, I led the development of the Agile Data Method because a bunch of us were concerned about how do you address data activities on agile teams, um, because data is very different than ju just programming. Um, so then that, and that sort of floundered for a while. It's, it's taking off now, but um, for a long time, the data community just didn't get this agile stuff. They were in denial. 
all that good sort of all, all that good sort of stuff. Um, did a lot of work in the RUP community as well, and then uh, joined IBM in 2006 as their uh, chief methodologist for IT. And it was there that we started developing, uh, di well, first of all, Dispin Agile Delivery. Um, so myself and Mark Lines, uh, we basically co-created that, uh, published the first book uh, through IBM Press in 2012. Uh, that was the point where I left IBM and Mark and I formed uh, Scott Amler Associates, which eventually became the Dispin Agile Consortium. And we grew and evolved the uh, Dispin Agile Delivery into what eventually became the Dispin Agile Toolkit um, to address all of enterprise agility. And uh, it was in doing that that we really got interested in governance. And, I, and frankly, uh, I was interested in governance you know, much, much earlier um, because you know, adult supervision uh, is important in the, in the IT space and in the software space. And, um, and it's often lacking uh, due to a lack of adults when it gets down to it. But the, you know, I hate to say that, but anyways, it seems to be true. And so we, we've got a few, we, you know, we've got some issues there. So anyways, um, we had embedded uh, governance strategies and thinking into, or oversight as you, as you like to call it, into Dispin Agile uh, pretty much from the very beginning. Um, and, and frankly, it was, and it was because of uh, Rationally Unified Process, because mm -hmm. Rationally Unified Process had some basic governance stuff uh, built right in as well, just to increase your chance of success. And then we, we streamlined that and, and extended it as well to all of, um, well, first all of IT, but then eventually um, the entire organization. So that's basically uh, where, you know, most of my life. And then finally in 2019, uh, professional life at least, um, and in 2019, uh, Project Management Institute purchased Disponential Consortium uh, for DA. And then Mark and I have been working there uh, basically until the end of uh, July of 2022. Well, thank you, Scott. And we might get into what's next for you. Um, I know that you're, you're, you're in your, uh, the, the last home stretch. Uh, of your tenure at BMI, um, so we we may get into that a little bit. Um, I have a few questions based on what you uh, just uh, explained a little bit, and one of the things is that you started your career in a financial space, which is probably quite heavy on governance, um, and then you moved into e-commerce space, which is probably quite light on governance. <laughs> um, how different did you find oversight? Uh, comp uh, between those two spaces, yeah, it was it was very different. I think the in the the financial space, particularly at the time, I remember this is late eighties, early nineties, mm. uh, pretty heavy, and uh, not really all that effective. So, um, you know, because I think at the time, and 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 arguably many people still do, they confuse bureaucracy with oversight. Uh, so, you know, filling out paperwork, filling out, you know, the same templates across, across teams, um, having some big review, uh, that's, that's bureaucracy, that's not really oversight. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, um, one, of the, one of the things I did when I was at, uh, I didn't talk about this, but uh, I wrote for a software development magazine for several years, and then eventually Dr. Dobbs Journal, and I, I, headed up a lot of their um, industry study stuff. I, you know, I ran industry surveys to find out what were people actually doing, you know, as opposed to um, what the, you know, the gurus were saying they were doing. And it was really interesting that, you know, one of the, one of the studies we did was specifically around governance. And it was amazing how many, how many teams were faking the governance, you know, mm -hmm. they were, you know, they, they'd fill out artifact, you know, they'd fill out the official report template or the, you know, do the official uh, architecture diagrams and, you know, put package it up, you know, use all the, all the right word document templates and stuff like that, get it reviewed, it would get signed off on, and then the, and then put on the shelf ne never to be looked at again. Mm -hmm. um, that's useful bureaucracy. That's not oversight at all. That's, that's useless overhead, injecting risk and cost um, in, into these teams. And um, that to me was just fundamentally wrong. So, and the reason why we ran that study was because I observed that happening over and over and over again, and was very, and thought we should gather some data on this and, and sort of, you know, call people on it. But, um, but having said that, so, you know, things were pretty heavy in the, in the financial space at the time, and, I, and, they, and they pretty much still are. But 
then in the e-commerce space and like just the the overall dot-com boom um, stuff, it was really light. Uh, you know, the rules had changed. Like everybody was saying, oh, the rules are different. We don't have to make any money. You know, it's, you know, it's uh, good because blah, 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 right? All this just nonsense. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and really the only governance uh, that ever sort of appeared in that space was when you had to go to IP or, or when, you, when you had to, not IP, when you had to go to, uh, to the marketplace, right? And you had to, and, and you were, you were going to do a, a, a launch and, uh, yeah, and you know, get all the money um, that, or, or when you had to go to um, a venture capitalist and, and, you know, spin some story, then there was a little bit of governance at that point. Other than that, it was a wild, wild west and uh, really wild stuff going on and arguably still happening. You know, if, I don't know if you're following the Uber um, debacle right now, but uh, apparently they paid off some economists and um, to write nice papers about them. So yeah, yeah, there's an interesting story flying around right now about that. But uh, don't know how true it is, but it seems true. <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, a little bit of Wild Wild West stuff uh, going on still. But yeah, be that as it may. So a lot of a lot of uh, so big differences is the short story. Uh, that short termism, that uh, that short termism mindset, the next making the next quarter's numbers and sacrificing the lamb, you know, it, it, then you have yeah. nothing left. It's quite quite prevalent still. Um, you um, have indicated that you've worked in data, business intelligence, uh, in that space. And you also mentioned that um, they're only catching up now on agility or recently. Um, and I've worked in, a, in a, a data warehouse space as well a few years ago, and um, it was quite uh, uh, an adjustment for the teams that I helped in order to move into the world of agility. And it was also quite interesting to see how we had to adjust some of the agile practices and methods and techniques out there to suit a, a data warehouse space. Um, I know that you are quite passionate about data warehousing and data and all of that. Before I ask my question, I just had another thought. That soft, uh, that research that you did on the uh, how people are faking the governance uh, artifacts, etc., was that the one you published on AmbiSoft? Yeah. So um, over the years, so when I was at uh, Soft Development and Dr. Dobbs, and then after that. I published um, all my findings uh, um, in an open source manner. I actually, um, in many ways, led um, that practice. Um, when I started that in the early 2000s, very few people, like very few researchers were sharing their source data, like the all of the source data and the questions as they were asked and the methodology as we ran it. Because um, my, my pitch was always, please don't trust me. Think for yourself, here's the data. <laughs> It's too well, hard. Come on, Scott. I know. I know. Don't trust me at all. And uh, and yeah, because and, and frankly, I don't trust any research where I can't get the get 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 access to the data. Why would I? I'd be a, mm. I would be an absolute fool to do that because I, I have to rely on somebody else's interpretation. Come on, right? Okay. Uh, not not comfortable with that. So, anyways, uh, yeah, it's all it's all published on ambisoft.com. You okay. can still download okay. load the data like 15, 20 years later. We, we'd, we'd love to share that uh, data um, as part of the publication. So um, uh, we'll get that from you. Coming back to the data and the BA work and, and, and the, the space in oversight and governance, um, wanted to check with you, um, why do you think that governance and oversight is important in the data and the data warehouse world? Well, uh, for many reasons. First, um, just a quality issue. Um, you require, you, I hope, <laughs> you require good quality data to make, you know, the better the quality of the data, the better the decisions that you can make, right? And uh, in particular, like in the, uh, uh, you know, it's particularly painful in the AI space right now if you don't have good quality data. Um, you know, it's bad enough when the humans are, are, you know, making guesses based on poor quality data, but when the computers are, then you've got a really interesting challenge. So, uh, yeah, we just need, we need good governance there. Unfortunately, a lot of the data governance is really heavy. Um, there's a, there's a wonderful book. I don't know if you know of it. Um, I believe it's called non-invasive data governance by Rob Siner. Um, and it's probably about 10 years old now, 
but he really sort of nails it in, in many ways because it's, it's all about being streamlined and collaborative and, and really, you know, making it as easy as possible to govern and not throw in all this overhead because the, the challenge with the overhead is if it's hard for me to be compliant to your governance strategy, chances are pretty good. I'm going to fake it. Like if it's easy, if, if it's easier for me to fake a document or to fake a review or to fake something, I'm probably going to fake it. Mm. You know, game it's it. just the way it is. Game right? it, yeah. 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 Totally game it. Yeah. And, and it happens all the time. And, and it, it's, it's interesting. I, um, I used to do assessments of organizations and I would go in, I would, you know, I'd assess the PMO or, or something or, or you know, assess an area and the, you know, the, the PMO would always get a hard look. And, uh, and it was interesting, like the, 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 the level of dysfunction in many of these PMOs was just phenomenal to me because they, you know, they'd, they'd have these heavyweight governance strategies or oversight strategies. And then I, I'd start asking them, so how do you know that it's not being faked? Oh, well, of course it's not being faked. We're really smart. <laughs> and I said, well, really, because when so, that sort of a process was inflicted on you, when you were a, you know, a mere lowly project manager, what did your teams do? Oh, well, we faked it. Come on. <laughs> what do you think the teams are doing now, right? If you faked it, then they're faking it too, right? Well, you know, well, yeah, we do that. I think they would uh, because I'm looking at your process and I know there's no way, um, like even, even if they're, you know, truthfully doing what you ask them to do, I know they're I know they're ignoring most of that work that gets produced because it doesn't have anything to do with reality, right? It's all about catering to the governance people. Um, and that that is a big problem in the data world. They, you know, in the traditional data world at least, they have a lot of um, just really bureaucratic overhead that they don't fully understand. Um, that they don't they don't understand the implications of what they're doing. Um, and then I got, I'll just look at the results. Um, that you know, most organizations struggle with data quality problems. Mm. And, and, they, and they've been following these traditional data governance strategies for decades in some cases, and it's still a mess. So this tells you it's working. <laughs> it's just not, wor it's not working. I'm not getting the job done. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so we got better. Um, when I worked with the, uh, the, the teams, um, they got a, a specialist, in, a data quality specialist in to help them. And I was surprised at how many dimensions and aspects there are to data quality. And that's not really well known um, in for decision makers. What are those aspects and what do they actually need in place to trust the data? It is astounding. And I think part of that ignorance has probably got to do with the voice at the table, the, 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 the data governance voice at the decision making table. That's not a, a thing that's traditionally been the thing to do. So it would just be, you know, in the 80s or in the, in the 90s, the tasters had to sit at the, in the kitchen and not really eat at the main table. So very similar type of setup. It, it, it is. And it's also a lot of it is the fault of the data people uh, because they... You know, they it's it's like they're, they're like the Wizard of Oz, right? They don't actually talk too much about what they do. And it's all this, well, we're really, we're the smart data people. You just trust us. We'll do this. And and, and then they go off. And, and it's usually like, you know, 99% useless bureaucracy uh, and uh, to get to the nugget of work that they're actually doing. And they, and they don't, they struggle to detect that in many, in many cases. But yeah, nobody knows what they do, right? What does a data scientist do? Very few people can answer that question. Well, that's a serious problem. <laughs> so, because if you don't know what these data anal analytics people are doing and the scientists and all this sort of stuff, then it's really hard to guide them. It's really hard to know how you how you can work with them effectively and govern them and lead them and 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 and, and you know work with them to help you um, do better things and frankly also make better decisions, right? So, a lot of the you know to be fair to the data people a lot of the data quality problems are the results of phenomenally poor management decisions. Um, the, it's, it's a classic technical debt problem, right? The, the project teams will you know, need to be on time, on budget to spec. They don't care about the quality, always short change quality, right? When, you, when you've got this on time, on budget mentality going on. So, and, and short changing data quality is phenomenally easy to do because you, almost, you know almost nothing about data because the data people haven't explained the realities they're facing 
you are making phenomenally bad decisions, which make their reality worse. So then they make your reality worse. And we're in this really vicious cycle of, you know, the project management crowd making bad decisions and then the data management crowd acting on them and not educating anybody on what the heck is actually going on. So then the data quality stuff, you know, the, the, the data, you know, the data technical debt just keeps, keeps rising. Um, and like a lot of organizations aren't even measuring it. Um, so how do you, how do you, you know, how do you actually manage something and improve something if you're not even measuring it? And worse yet, you don't even know to measure it because the data people haven't opened their mouths. Mm. All right. Yeah. So, you know, really, there's really weird forces going on in these organizations around data and um, not a lot's being done about it. Yeah. Well, um, on this point, it has never ceased to amaze me how year after year after year, um, I teach lots of um, business analysts and product owners, and I ask them about exactly this topic of data quality and how assured are they of the quality of their data. And I always see uh, blank stares, you know, deer in the headlights. And I tell them, look, are you aware of something called data profiling? They go, what? Uh, yes, data profiling. Most of the database systems these days have really clever data profiling tools. They can allow you to do this and that and so on. They go, wow, really? Yes, really. <laughs> Why aren't your organizations? You know, the first they had great tools in the data profiling in the late 80s. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but you got to know to use them, right? And, exactly. but, but, also, but a big part of the problem, though, is, is also... Um, the data community is not really up to speed on quality techniques. Hmm. So, for example, you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll I work, do a lot of work with data data people, and then, you know, blah blah blah, data quality, you know, yada yada yada, and then I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let them go for a few minutes, and then I'll say, so okay, tell me about your automated regression test suite for your database, and then it's like deer caught in headlights. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> so, if you're not testing you don't really have an asset, right? Like, 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 like that's the thing, right? Like if, if data was a real asset in your organization, you would have an automated test suite for your data sources. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Bottom line. That's just the bottom line. I'm sorry. That's the bottom line on that one. And then, and then you, then you start asking them, you know, have you even thought about that? It's like, no, or, or it's always oh, not our problem. It's the app team's problem. No, no. no. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, sure. They should be testing, but no, um, the day, you know, you know, if, if you're worried about anything remotely close to data semantics, the last thing you want to do is let your app teams uh, be, <laughs> be responsible for that. The different apps have different semantics. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it's the way the reality, that's the way the world works. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so, you know, so it's a lot of, a lot of issues around stepping up and, and actually understanding the, the realities of, you know, how do you lead, how do you govern? And, but yeah, if you want, if you want data quality, you need to adopt real quality techniques. You know, move away. You know, some of the bureaucratic stuff is okay, but if you rely on bureaucracy, you're not going to get the job done mm -hmm. at all. You got to automate the heck out of everything. It will be gamed. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's yeah. very interesting how um, we can get the Pareto principle to work for us because 80% of the defects come from 20% of the uh, trouble spots. And if you start to do kind of good profiling and notice um, dangling um, um, rows and so on, you think, why is this happening? And then you discover, you extinguish sources of such errors and all of a sudden things no longer deteriorate. Uh, you keep them. So <laughs> prophylaxis is a lot uh, safer and easier. It's very much like with uh, normal human health, right? It's far better to to keep in good shape than to to have to remedy a chronic issue. Yeah, definitely. Scott, um, the agile modeling work that you do, um, how does this help uh, oversight and governance? Yeah, so agile modeling and you know modeling and planning are about thinking before doing uh, when it gets down to it. And um, that was basically what agile modeling was all about. So, you know, 20 years ago, when we when we first started uh, describing what we were doing, um, it was heresy. Like we were we were talking about <laughs> really. It was. Oh man, I got I got some nasty looks, uh, particularly from the modeling community, well, from the agile community and from the, the modeling community, um, because back then models were these big, huge, onerous things that you did up front, and you. 
and uh, you, you'd invest a big pile of effort and then you'd hand them off to the team who would then ignore them. Um, and it was a big surprise when, when something bad happened. And our entire point was to observe what worked. And so we were talking about weird things like whiteboard sketches and using sticky notes, and um, which is the norm now. Uh, but back in the day, that was radical. That was absolutely radical. And, um, and what, but I would argue, though, that the, the pendulum has probably swung too far on modeling. So now where it's only sticky notes and only... Um, <clears throat> Only whiteboard sketches. Uh, we really should have. You know, we, we really do need um, some tool, you know, some better tooling um, to do more sophisticated modeling where it makes sense. And actually, the data community does pretty well there. Uh, they've got some very good uh, data modeling tools. Uh, but because that's a very straightforward and narrow domain, um, it's complicated, but it's narrow. So you can put together good tools. They they've enjoyed good modeling tools for for several decades now, whereas the application development community not so much. Um, although systems engineering community has pretty good tools too, but once again, narrow domains, right? Once you get your hardware platform in place, um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward to build a modeling tool for it. So, and they tend to have better engineers in that space too. That, that also helps, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I think, uh, so anyway, so agile modeling was all about modeling to the, you know, modeling, uh, using the appropriate tools for the, the context of the situation that you're in, like using the right technique to the right extent. Um, at the right time. And our point was always, you know, do just enough modeling, do, you know, have artifacts that are just barely good enough. Um, and the challenge with that is, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it depends on how complicated the situation is, how good your people are, um, you know, how much collaboration and how easy will it be to update the model later on, right? Um, so depending on those factors, you need more or less modeling. Um, so it really does depend, you know, regulatory uh, compliance and good stuff like that as well. Um, so it really does depend on on many factors, many of which are qualitative. So um, it's really it's like quality. It's in the eye of the beholder. Okay, Scott. So uh, want to come back to your experience uh, with discipline agile. So um, we we know that you've written a number of books about DA or discipline agile. Um, tell us a bit more about that journey. Yeah, definitely. So it really, so it came out of um, out of my work at IBM. So when I joined, I excuse me, um, I still got my COVID cough after three months. It's not fun, uh, but anyways, the um, um, so when I joined IBM in two thousand and six, I was brought in to help bring agility into 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 the rational product offerings, um, but as well, you know, basically to help fix rough um, at the time, and and that was a futile effort, but. We gave it, we gave it a good shot, but um, anyway, so I was I was working with organizations around the world to explain agility and lean and and apply it at scale. And what was interesting, myself, my team, and the business partners we were working with, including uh, Mark Lines's company, um, we were we were going around the world uh, helping organizations, and we we observed a couple things. Um, one of the things we observed was that uh, everybody was doing Agile differently. Um, and they were, they were struggling to say what they were doing. Everybody said, oh, we're doing Scrum or we're doing XP. Uh, but then when you go and look at what they were doing, it was, yeah, you might have been doing a little bit of Scrum, but you're doing like 50 other things that you didn't talk about at all. Um, we also found that no matter how good they were, organizations were always struggling with something. Um, you know, let alone the organizations that were just struggling with pretty much everything. <laughs> so, um, and they're spending like sometimes millions of dollars figuring out Agile, like all these transformations were, were really sort of struggling. I mean, and many of them still are, you know, 15 years later, but um, sometimes in the same companies. <laughs> but uh, anyways, that's a different story. So yeah, so we, we, so we noticed that everybody was doing things differently um, but we also noticed they needed help. And, and those were two very different observations, right? So our conclusion was that a, a, a prescriptive process wasn't going to get the job done because everybody works differently. Um, we also had the issue, or at least I had the issue, that uh, I didn't want to create yet another method. Um, I'd been there, done that, um, had all the arrows in my back. So um, just wasn't interested. So I was highly reticent to put anything down on paper. Um, so, but anyways, so after a while though, it, it became very clear that something was needed in the marketplace. And we eventually, so we realized we couldn't have a prescriptive, here's one, you know, one size fits all 
here's the magic recipe, just do this type of an approach. Um, we needed to give people choices. And that's where disfinancial delivery came about. So we, we put together this framework um, at the time, this framework of here's how you do software development from beginning to end. Um, and here's all aspects of software development. Here's how it all fits together. And here are the choices you need to make, right? Because a, a, a data warehousing team will have different types of models, will have different approaches to things, will work in a different way than an application development team. Uh, they'll work differently than say a legacy, like a team that's working on a legacy system and evolving it. Um, they will work very differently than a, another type of team. So different teams in different situations work in different ways. Plus you will learn and improve, I hope you will learn and improve over time. So you need choices, right? Like how can I, you know, what should I experiment with next? What should I, what technique should I try to see if it works for me in my situation? And so we put together dad disfinancial delivery to describe that and to describe the choices. And here's what you need to think about. Um, and, and at the time as well, um, we were we were working on DevOps stuff. So dad, like the original dad book, if you go back and read it now, there's a boatload of DevOps stuff in it uh, because we were setting ourselves up for the next release of dad, which ended up being called Disponential DevOps um, to address the you know full enterprise class picture of, of DevOps. And then that expanded IT and then, and then uh, eventually the enterprise. So the so it was really all about that and it was just this evolution of we just kept you know we, we started with a reasonably straightforward small problem software development which isn't all that small or straightforward um and then kept expanding and expanding um because we kept because it you know software development touches other other parts of the organization which touches other parts and so on um so we just kept expanding out until finally we sort of left it at the enterprise level although having said that um recently in the last year or two um, we started looking at, uh, because we're talking about vendor management procurement, mm. um, we're looking at the overall ecosystem where you're working with multiple organizations and also looking at um, you know, just social responsibility and environmental responsibility mm. as well. Um, just, you know, because, because <laughs> that's a nice thing to do. Um, but, uh, but certainly the, you know, the concept of an ecosystem of, of organizations working together is a, an interesting problem. Um, you know, both from a, you know, just doing it, but certainly from a governance point of view. Okay, thank you for that, Scott. Um, because I've been part on, on uh, I've, I've participated in a, in a part of that journey. Um, and I know what, see, what it currently says on the, on the Discipline Agile content, but um, for our, our uh, listeners, um, how do you think the DEI toolkit addresses oversight and governance? Yeah, so we've always baked um, oversight and governance in from the very beginning. So from a, a team point of view, uh, it's just start with like just financial delivery. Uh, so, you know, software team stuff. Um, we built in uh, uh, lightweight milestones um, that are risk-based, not documentation-based. And uh, so the idea was that because teams are different in different situations, some teams are in a regulatory environment, some are not. Uh, some are doing very complex stuff, some are doing fairly straightforward stuff, you need to be governed in different ways and you deserve to be governed well. That was always, you know, so one of our um, fundamental observations was you are being governed and we believed you deserve to be governed well. Um, we, we also chose to observe that in most cases you were not being governed well, uh, but here's, here's how, and so we went about answering the question, how could you be governed well? Um, so yes, we built in the, the you know, the lightweight, uh, milestones, uh, so the, and risk-based milestones. So then what happens is so a team in a regulatory, like a life critical regulatory environment will have a reasonably sophisticated approach to being governed because, you know, life critical, um, a team that's building a, a website in a non-regulatory environment. Yeah. It can be really, really lightweight because, you know, low risk, right. So, you know, govern to the risk basically, and, 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 and good stuff like that. We also looked at the full range of roles. We didn't limit ourselves to say Scrum or, or others. We looked at the, the, you know, the greater picture. And because uh, and, that's important, right? So then, but then as um, we, we started expanding, we realized that uh, we had a, uh, what was called a process goal that called Govern Delivery Team. It's now called Govern Team. 
but how do you govern a team? Like, how do you, you know, how, how does a team get governed is basically the answer, is the question we're answering there. Um, but we also have what we call a process blade or a process area for enterprise governance and called governance. And we, and it addresses the question of how do you govern the entire enterprise, all the activities, all the teams, all the people going on. We also bake in governance to other process blades. So for example, uh, data, the, there's a process blade, a process area called data management. How do you govern data stuff? So that gets addressed there. Um, same thing for security. So security specific governance is in the security blade, data management specific governance in the, in the data blade and so on. Um, but then how is it all managed? Finance has financial governance and so on. Um, but the overall governance, how does it all fit together? Because one of the challenges with um, uh, you know, business area or process area governance, like so you've got a, a data governance group and a security governance group and a finance governance group and a you know, procurement governance group and so on, is how does it all fit together? And what happens if you're on the receiving end of all these different types of governance? Because like, the data governance will be great. The security governance will be great. The architecture governance will be great. The finance governance will be great, but it'll all add up to the overwhelming and useless bureaucracy, um, no matter how good all those separate things are. So if it doesn't fit together, and if it doesn't, and, and, and if the governance things you're looking for um, don't reflect each other. So if the data guys are, are looking for blue and the architecture governance people are looking for red, I got a serious issue, right? Is that, I'm either blue or I'm red, not both. Might be purple. Make a decision. Um, and then, so then, what happens there? Oh, I fake it, right? I'll really be yellow, but I'll tell the data guys, "Oh yeah, we're blue," um, and they'll pass the review because they're not that bright. I'll tell the architecture <laughs> guy it's red, and I'll pass the review because they're not that bright either. And meanwhile, I'll be yellow. So you know, all the yellow work will be going on. I'm telling the data guys blue. Telling the architecture guys red. You know, the finance people, uh, it's mauve, who knows, right? Um, and they're all buying it. And, and, this is, and this is what happens because you've got to survive the governance, right? I got to get the job done and still make it look as if I'm being governed and, you know, pretend to care and all that good sort of stuff too. So, and, and, and this is what happens in organizations when the governance folks aren't working together. Um, you know, the, the people on the receiving end will do what they can to survive. And I, I, don't, I don't blame them at all. So there was a, an example from, I think, Jonathan Smart of what he did at, at Barclays in, in the UK about how we actually created a multidisciplinary governance capability. Yeah. And all projects had to go through that capability instead of having to jump subsequent uh, hurdles. You only needed to, to, to convince yeah. this group. And that, that helped accelerate their delivery considerably in, in Barclays. And I know that you researched that as well. Um, you work quite closely yeah. with Jonathan on that. Yeah, we were we were we were in there working with them at the time when they were doing stuff like that. They were, you know, they were adopting ideas out of uh, Spotify. So they called it the Governance Tribe, and uh, yeah, that was a great idea, and it worked. It worked really well. Um, I'd seen similar things at other organizations, but Barclays really took it to the next level. Um, very very good. Very good. So um, for our uh, listeners, uh, we'll share those links as well uh, into the process blades or, or uh, the fr from Discipline Agile, those specific areas that you can go and explore. Um, okay. Uh, so on, uh, on writing the books, uh, especially the last one, because uh, I was part of the, the, the team that helped you write it, uh, what was your uh, funniest moment on writing the book that choose your well, own. Yeah, so it, it's always, um, it's a lot easier to talk about writing books than it is to do it. Um, <laughs> so I know. <laughs> funniest moment, hard to, hard to pick a funny moment. Um, frustrating might be a better thing to be thinking about, but I think that the, the funny moments are always just, you know, the boneheaded things that you do, you know, or, you know that you, you, you start writing about your house, oh man, that's not right. And, uh, or you get some really, you know, competing, or not competing, but you get like um, feedback from three different people and it's all like just really blatantly different from each other. You know, oh, okay, we got an issue here. 
Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's always uh, writing. Yeah. Like I said, writing books is way harder than you think. Um, so, um, it, it's like everything you, you always grossly underestimate the amount of work and time it takes. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Oreo. Well, one thing that comes to mind for me is the nature of the problem that we've uncovered. We have these, um, tendencies to organize functionally. So we naturally gravitate into, into silos. And as a result, we end up with these stovepipes of governance, as you just described. Um, it's only relatively recently that we've attempted to reinvigorate the value stream perspective, and many organizations are, are starting to see this. But on the other hand, uh, we still have project management offices, right? So what are your thoughts on how might we um, inspire practitioners, professionals in project management offices to embrace and contribute better to a value stream approach uh, and a more of an integrated governance approach? What, what are your thoughts in that area? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. So first, uh, Sanjeev Augustine and a couple others wrote a really good book. Uh, I believe the title is from PMOs to VMOs, value management offices. Um, and that came out actually almost pretty much exactly a year ago. And uh, Mark Lines and I wrote the, the forward for that. So it's a phenomenally well-written forward. You know, the book's worth it just for that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really good book. And, and the reason why is it, it, it works through the differences between like a traditional PMO and you know what they've been doing and what really needs to be done. And um, so Sanjeev uses the term value management office, which is a great term. I, I prefer value delivery office uh, for a couple of reasons. So, so let's sort of piece, piece that out. Um, so first, it's not just about projects and it never really was. So projects are certainly important. Um, and, and yes, there's the project, the you know, project to product movement, all that sort of stuff. And, and, and fine, but um, we'll never ever be, you know, be in a, in a world where there's no projects going on. So regardless of the marketing rhetoric in that community, um, but we can observe that there are non-projects. Um, so for example, you know, one of the great lies about PMOs is a PMO is not a project. It's a longstanding team, right? right. It's a longstanding effort, right? So it's not a project. So they're not, they're not following their own, uh, you know, their own little rhetoric. Um, so anyway, so that's usually my, one of my favorite, you know, you know first knife I, I will jab. In. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so, so just choose to observe, right? So this is what we did in DA, right? So we, we support, explicitly support project ways of working. We also exp um, explicitly support non-project ways of working, like, you know, longstanding product teams. We support, um, you know, uh, an exploratory life cycle for like lean startup type stuff and a program life cycle and others, even a serial life cycle. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we'll soon be adding explicit support for that. So your organizations are hybrids, you know, and, and, your, and your projects are hybrids too, right? So your project and non-projects are hybrids. So you've got a hybrid organization doing pro project stuff and non-project stuff. So labeling yourself a project management office is probably not the way to go just from a strategic point of view, right? Because that's only a part of the work. And in some, particularly in the IT space, a shrinking part of the work. So, you know, tying yourself onto the shrinking stuff, generally not a good career move, but go ahead, you know, do whatever you want, right? <laughs> so, you know, and frankly, wouldn't you rather be talking about value, not just spinning stories, but actually talking about value, right? So anyway, so focus on value, not on projects. Um, and then focus on delivery, not just management, because we've seen uh, many efforts managed really well, but they're still failures. So being the manager of a failure, I don't care how good you're working. I don't care how great of a manager you are if, if, if it's still a failure, right? So you really want to deliver value, not just manage the creation of value, not just manage. So it's really, it really is about value delivery. Um, and then if you want to call yourself an office or a group, you know, whatever, uh, I never really cared. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the last, you know, the, O, big deal, you know, so you're a project. 
you know, organization office, whatever. Yeah. And this is exactly what micro enterprises are, are trying to uh, uh, achieve is, is to f the focus on value delivery and not managing yeah. the, the process. So, um, and they do have governance. They, there's one or two examples that we've come across of where they do have oversight uh, um, functions, but those oversight functions are also responsible to the customer that they're delivering to not to some arbitrary hierarchy up into the organization. That, that, yeah, that yeah. was quite an interesting, interesting perspective. Yeah, well, and it's still fun. Like, it's always like certainly being customer focused and you know, how, how am I delivering value to my customers and, and, and continuing to do it. Um, so one, one of the things I always like to talk about value streams, a lot of people describe a value stream as a beginning and ending with a customer. I don't want it to end with a customer. That's foolish. I want it to continue. I want it to begin, end, and then continue on, right? I want, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. why it's, you know, yeah. you scrap the loop. Uh, we want to, you know, continually deliver value to our customers, hopefully forever. Um, and certainly we need to be governing from their point of view. Uh, but we also need to realize we do have other stakeholders other than the, the eventual end customer, right? You know, we, we do have regulatory concerns and mm -hmm. um, I would argue we, we have societal concerns as well. So, um, but certainly, you know, um, but yeah, but I think the overall, uh, you know, governing to the needs of the stakeholders rather than, you know, the needs of some manager in the sky um, <laughs> is probably the way to go. A mythical management group that uh, who knows what they're doing. Mm. Scott, you contributed quite a lot to the research that we've done in, in our respective lockdowns. And I, I, I remember you, you starting to say after the third or fourth session is that you're looking forward. This is the highlight of your week, etc. <laughs> yeah. um, we've, uh, uh, we've done a, a little bit of, we were going to write a book, but we ended up running a podcast series uh, around this. And wanted to, I wanted to just go back to what we actually ended up with. Um, now, remember the, the old story about when you ask an engineer to create something artistic, um, <laughs> you might get something <laughs> that you didn't bargain for. So uh, this is where we've landed. And, I, and we know it needs a little bit of, uh, oops, what happened? I just, uh, let's share again. Um, we, we, we know that when engineers create something like this, uh, anyway, the intention is, is that we're looking at, at it as a, as a type of a, uh, a galaxy. And we talked about this thriving zone or the galaxy zone that you have when, uh, the uh, Goldilocks zone, when, when you look at a galaxy is where life really exists. And we uh, we try to capture that thinking that um, we we've explored with uh, the polarity mapping, uh, and you, okay. you're quite familiar. So we try to represent that. So towards the middle of the uh, model is the more traditional perspectives, uh, yeah. uh, and then towards the outer side of the uh, of this hexagon is the uh, newer perspectives or um, uh, views on oversight um, going forward. So what we're using this is uh, to try and aim for the Goldilocks zone and in every context that would look different. We've also changed the ex uh, this explore and innovate versus maintain competent capability was actually the result of three different um, of the balances that we explored with the with the community that uh, that we that, that we did and instead of creating a nine sided uh picture engineering picture um we ended up with a six sided one where we've collected all three into this tension that is um, between maintaining a competent capability and having enough leeway to explore and innovate in your organization um, the rest is very similar to the stuff we've done two years ago uh, with us. We still have values and fears as well. And um, so when you look at this picture, other than the, the engineering artistic flair, um, uh, what, what, have you, uh, what do you notice? Now, this is two years on. 
Um, what are you seeing here that um, we may have missed? Yeah, it, I I really like it. Um, it's you, you could definitely use some help from a, a graphic <laughs> artist. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you know what? This is way better than any diagrams I can do. So uh, you know, so yeah, <laughs> I feel your pain on the graphic side of things. But uh, yeah, I really, I really like. I really like this and because this is something we we also um, uh, deal with with the scaling factors in um, uh, in dysphenagile mm -hmm. um, that you know, it's really it's really you know where are you in you know where are you on that scale that makes sense for you um, and I think that's um, that's a critical concept um, so I really I really like this I think the Goldilocks zone probably needs to be a bit bigger or maybe the um, like somewhere in the middle is the you know the really bright green stuff and then it you know gets more yellowy or more gray on on either side right yeah. um but you know but anyways uh, but that's a graphics issue um yeah i like um the iron triangle and, and agile triangle i would sort of question it it's um it's certainly a major concept without a doubt or you know major topic um, but I, I think the, the problem with the Iron Triangle was always people misunderstood it. And because um, the, the message was always, you've got to let at least one or, one or more of those factors uh, of, the, of the three Iron Triangle factors um, um, vary. Um, otherwise, you've got a quality problem. Now, sadly, that, that message was always ignored. Um, so the, or almost always ignored. But yeah, so I think yeah, I, I don't see a lot of difference, actually, to tell you the truth, between the Iron Triangle and the Agile Triangle, because the, the messages are basically similar, right? Like, let, let one or more things vary, um, it has, you know, the way I've always boiled it down. But, so, yeah, so, um, so that might open up one of the hex sides for you. Um, but, yeah, other than that, I, I really like it. I like the, um, the, the personal versus organizational one, because, you know, we've talked about that in DA for, for years. Um, with the enterprise awareness uh, principle. Um, you might have an issue with the word safety um, because of psychological safety, uh, because you want psychological safety, right? So, um, and that helps give you courage. So maybe, I, 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 know, I know the concepts you're getting at, um, but maybe the word safety is not the word you wanna be looking for there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I really, I really like this. Um, yeah, good stuff. Thank you. We, we call things, it our galaxy view. So yeah, one of the things that um, the agile to iron triangle balance gives us, uh, and it does so very surreptitiously, it introduces the focus on value, because the agile uh -huh. triangle is about focus on value, focus on quality, but don't forget the constraints. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So then maybe. So there's a good point. So maybe you should be talking about value. So instead of saying iron triangle, talk about value there. And instead of saying iron triangle, um, oh, I don't know, uh, constraints would be the wrong word. But um, so, so yeah, so what I'm getting at is what, um, what I've always liked to talk about is for the people who believe they need to be on budget, that's a trivial issue to me. I would rather be spending yeah. the money wisely, right? Yeah. Instead yeah. of being on time or on schedule, that's a trivial issue to me. I would rather be releasing when it something when it when the best time it's best suited to to release it, right? Um, on scope, you know, building something to scope is an absolute sucker's game. I would rather be building what you know, fulfilling the needs of my stakeholders. And so, it, and, and this was actually something we did a study on, right? We we basically asked. Um, ask people, you know, what's more important to you, or, or are they both equal? And it was it was actually interesting. The executives tended to lean more towards, you know, spending the money wisely and building the right thing and releasing it when it needs to be released, rather than on time, on budget, to spec. And the project managers, particularly because they've been trained in this, um, they believe, you know, they're strongly uh, believed in on on budget, on time, to spec. And, um, and they were like way out in the left field. Everybody else was sort of at the one end of the spectrum and the PMs were at the other end of the spectrum. And that, I think, um, explained a lot of their behavior at the time. And, and this is like, you know, 15 years ago now. Um, mm. But 
uh, still. Uh, so anyways, yeah, so maybe, yeah, maybe, that, yeah. So if the thing is, so my, my, point, my final point, if you're getting at, if you wanna get at value delivery uh, or something along those lines, then, then explicitly call it out, right? Don't mm -hmm. force people to read between the lines or stumble into, you know, your actual message of, yeah, focus on value rather than on, you know, bureaucracy stuff. Yeah, so uh, it would be then focus on value balance with focus on conformance. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, because, it, and, 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 and it's something that's got to be a range, right? Because in some cases, you know, you really do need to focus on the scope because you're in a regulatory situation, right? You just yeah, gotta yeah. fill, yeah, fill yeah, the yeah. spec. Yes. Conformance. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. Definitely worth uh, uh, very good uh, ideas here. Thank you very much, Scott, for that. Uh, we're going to go back to some of our other questions that that we that, that we've covered um, or what wanted to cover with you, um, and uh, ask you, you. You talk about having the arrows in your back, uh, etc. What are your greatest moments with Oversight? What are the good news and the good stories, how you saved it, uh, or, ex or examples of how the day was saved? Yeah, well, I think a lot of it is always helping break the log jams in organizations, right? Because mm -hmm. the, either, uh, the, either the governance is really good or it's really bad. It's, there's never really much of an in-between. And when it's really bad, then you've got to start then you know somebody it's almost always an outsider that's got to come in and deal with that issue because the governance people are usually senior executives um, with power and nobody will speak the truth to power or power just won't listen to the truth mm. um, and somebody from the outside's got to come in and, and really ask some hard questions and my you know go-to strategy is always to talk about risk you know what risks do you believe your um, you're, you're addressing here and what risks are you introducing, which is a really nasty question because they're, well, what do you mean? Um, we're not introducing any risk. Oh, you better believe you are. Um, you know, let's walk through that one. And, uh, and, and uh, also, how are you being governed? Um, that's always my favorite question to governance people as well. It's like, it, really? You're, you're the governance folks. Okay, so how are you governed? And there better be a story about a board of directors keeping an eye on you. Um, and actively keeping an eye on you and, uh, and giving you a hard time <laughs> because that's their job or that should be their job. Uh, so anyway, so, so, so there's that, those sorts of things, but it's always, you know, what risks are you addressing? And then are there better ways to address those risks? Um, and I also like to ask you, so how do you think it's being faked? Um, because I know it is, right? When I, whenever I see some horrendous governments, I know people are faking it. Um, and do they know? Like, did, and the governance people never seem to know even when they did it themselves, uh, like when they faked it in the past themselves, then they, they, they seem to forget. But uh, yeah, it's just that there's no way somebody's do, you know, doing that or, um, but, and it's not, and it's almost never being measured. This is the real, um, it gets back to how are you governing the governance folks? What measures are in place to measure the effectiveness of your governance strategy, your oversight strategy? Um, because a basic measures of, did you ever use that artifact again? If the answer is no, it's useless. <laughs> it's just useless, right? Um, yeah. It has to be. You know, it got you through the review. That was the only purpose for that document. That's Another question that, that would quite work quite well in, in that uh, is to consider whether the problem that a specific governance policy or uh, approach had, whether that problem still exists. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... When, when I found yeah, yeah. when asking that, people look at you as if you've grown a third head. You know, it's like, what's going on with you? You're this weirdo. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's actually a really good problem, uh, a really good question to ask uh, because, and there's wonderful examples. Like, and and you know, let's pick on the Agile community. You know, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the Agile Manifesto um, and actually read the words uh, behind the principles, and then ask yourself, do those problems still exist? Like, you know, they talk about delivering working software every, you know, once a quarter or something, like, you know, every few months or quarterly. Um, that's brutally slow. Um, like at the time, like, you know, 20 years ago, holy crow, that's rocket science. Um, mm -hmm. Now today, you're only delivering quarterly. Hmm. 
you got a problem there, right? Um, you know, why aren't you delivering weekly or daily? Um, mm -hmm. what's, what's slowing you down? So, yeah, so, you know, do those, you know, a lot of those problems don't exist, at least in a lot of firms, they, they don't exist. And some, they obviously still do, but um, in a lot of firms, they obviously don't. So um, there's, there's room for improvement there. I recently came across uh, a re one of the write-ups around why the clothing brand Zara, Z-A or A is so successful. And what they found was, is that they don't go to a factory and then have a hundred thousand dresses made and then distribute it into the world. They only have of a specific dress. They only have one or two made that would go into a, a shop and they, they distribute it that way. And then they will only make more, which would be delivered within a week if they see certain indicators ticking up. Uh, in demand of what they want so they've they've cut down considerably on their costs just by following that little model of only making more of what sells instead of having uh, warehouses full of stuff that doesn't sell is yes, not, not only that but what they do is they bring this slightly imperfect um, model um, mm. and uh, the person goes oh uh, in conversation, you ask, what would you like instead? Well, I, it would, would be nice if it had one of these and one of those. And a few days later, hey, there's one that has one of these and one of those. And all of a sudden you have this feeling of, see, I've given my feedback and it's been, oh, I'm going to have that as well. Thank you. <laughs> right? So you're yeah. essentially learning from the market um, and you're creating the fashion with the public. Mm. So therefore, no wonder it's so much more um, engaging and attractive then why Zara is so successful. Yeah, but, but you can only do that if you choose to have a value stream that can move that quickly. Like, right. you know, imagine you know, talking to, a, to an organization that where, you know, back in the day, which and it's still happening to a, for a lot of them, you know, they would go to the Paris fashion show and see, you know, what's coming up for, for six months from now. That's and right. they would be looking at the, the annual color scheme that gets gets pumped out by the design community of oh well, you know orange is this is this is this year's color. Um, so they would all pump out orange version, orange knockoffs of what they saw in Paris um, six months ago. Um, and then you know um, you know if that doesn't sell, they've got a serious problem. So Zara has chosen to shorten that feedback cycle down to days or weeks rather mm -hmm. than many many months um so that's um uh, and 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 the entire value it's and it's the entire value stream it's mm. not just like one store running their own right. show it's everybody it's worldwide in the entire, yeah worldwide they, yeah, yeah exactly they do this worldwide so um what are your uh, observations about the most frequent struggles uh with oversight or oversight situations in organizations I think it's, excuse me, I think it's just a disconnect. Um, a lot, a lot of the cases, either the oversight group um, is working too slowly or too onerous, you know, too onerously, or it, there's just too much bureaucracy involved, right? You know, they fill out these templates and all that sort of stuff. And uh, so there's that, or just a lack of understanding <laughs> of you know, teams of, you know, why we need oversight. Like, you know, do I know enough to go for help? Um, can I detect, you know, earlier, you know, we were, we were, you know, joking around a bit about the, the graphics, right? So do we, know, like, we all inherently know we need help from, <clears throat> on the graphic end, right? Yeah. Um, so do we know to go for help. Do we know that we need to, you know, take, you know, and then listen to the, you know, some graphics person that could, you know, maybe help there. Um, same thing on the, on the financing or, or in the data quality space, right? Can the, can the data, can the data people listen to and take some direction on how to improve and what they what they need to focus on. Um, similarly, can they give direction to the dev teams of how to develop good quality data and leverage existing data and and not reinvent the wheel and and, uh, and maybe test and all this sort of stuff, right? Can they can they all work together? So I think um, and what are the feedback cycles into the governance process? Uh, because like, how do the government, you know, like one of the reasons why the, the governance people get disconnected is because there's no feedback going back to them saying, hey, you know, 
we're faking this. <laughs> you know? well, we, and nobody's ever going to yeah. step up. It's, yeah. actually, it's actually interesting, right? Because years ago, um, I got into a huge scrap. I was at a, at a client and we were on, on their most important project. And we had to, I was like the lead architect and I had to, you know, we had to bring it home. Right. And we were just scrapping it out constantly with the data guys. And it got to the point where we said, you know what, we got to deliver. We can't, we can't be fooling around with these yo-yos. So I took two people and I said, just produce documents. Like, you know, whatever these guys want, just do it. Right. And, you know, and, you know, so of the 30 people on the team, these two, all they did was produce documents to, to get the data people out of my hair. Right. Cause we were like literally, um, you know, we were arguing back and forth about various things and they would, you know, they would want all these huge documents that they wanted to sign off on in order to do some simple thing. And I would, we, my team would just go and do it, right? We, we could get it done faster than we could write it out to get blessed and three weeks later, go to the steering committee and yada, 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 right? So we just did the work, but we had two guys that did all the bureaucracy to go to the steering community, you know, committee. We pretended to listen all that good sort of stuff, right? So, and it, it, and we got away with it. And suddenly, the, you know, the data guys loved us because you know we were conforming to their, you know, to their to their governance strategies. So then, at the end of that project, um, in my exit interview, I said, and, and it ended up being a successful project. But at the at the end, I said, okay, here's what we actually did. So you know, it was like eight or nine percent of my budget was a complete write off because to conform to your, your bureaucracy, here's what we did. We didn't get caught. So not only was a significant portion of my budget a complete and utter waste, but every person that we blocked, which was this entire group over here and a few others over here, because we were scrapping it out with them as well, um, none of them added value. So the real problem in this organization is not the fact that I just threw away 7% of your budget, Thank you very much. Um, the real problem was I was I blocked a third of your of the rest of the organization, and none of them detected that I was doing it. Oh, and by the way, you know, you just told me we were the most successful project you've had in several years. So you gamed it. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we we said we we blocked you. It is what it is. Um, you couldn't detect it. I got away with it. Here's what the cost was on my end. Uh, thank you very much. I'm never going to work for you again. <laughs> so, and, uh, yeah and i never did oh actually i did but um I, you know different management structure you know, years later um but uh yeah and but yeah but who would do that right like nobody has that level of honesty going out it's like you know thanks for throwing away seven percent of your budget uh you know nobody's gonna do that they're just gonna take the money and run yeah they would um, one thing you, you've said earlier, and which is a really good connection to, to my next question, is that a few years ago, I worked with a customer, and they chose a specific well-known Agile framework out there to implement. I won't name names. Um, and it went really, really, it slowed thing, everything down. And... I was brought in as a as an agile coach, and one of the things I started asking is that, what were the reasons for selecting this framework? Can you show me why this was selected? And this is one. Th uh, this is leading me to this question. What I notice is when it comes to selecting an approach in agility, and you probably get get quite a lot of this types of things working with DA because first of all, DA is seen out there as a competing framework, which we know it is not. It works with all the frameworks out there, but still the industry still views it. Oh, a discipline agile, another framework. But what I'm noticing is, is that very few people can actually justify why we chose framework X for our organization. Maybe it's a, a golf, uh, you know, a deal on the golf course that, that, that could, uh, so on, but what do you think are the types of governance we need when you need to, or oversight that you need with the choice of agile framework? Yeah, so that's that's really hard. Like in theory, you should be able to say ask basic questions, right? Like, 
what 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 is the need? What what are your requirements? What what mm. type of problem are you trying to solve? Does that framework solve that type of problem? But and yes, it might or might not. Who knows, right? So fundamentally, that's what you should be doing. But the reality is, it's like you said, the the, the decisions are made by executives who, frankly, almost never have a clue, right? Mm. So their entire decision making process is. Well, some other company, you know, I, I talked m- with my buddy on the golf course, exactly you're saying, and his company is going with this framework, therefore I should too, mm. right? And then, well, why did he go with it? Well, because he went he went fishing with some yo-yo. That, <laughs> right? Exactly. You, can't, you, know, if you follow the chain of evidence and it's like, oh yeah, and, and it gets down to, well, I really like that, you know, some executive three years ago really liked the poster, uh, you know, so, and that's the level or, or you know, uh, read a magazine article or something. So yeah, there's not a lot of um, real decent research going because it's a hard problem, right? Like, do you even know what your problem is? Um, is a, a hard question to ask. Um, and then you know, do, in, do you can you talk to somebody that can intelligently discuss? You know, why is this framework? Why does this framework work here? Why is this a better choice? Why is that a better choice? And so on. And would you you, you know first would you be able to find a person like that? Would you know enough? to listen to them and so and and, or it could also be part of the decision is always you know i'm working with consulting company x they have expertise in this therefore i should go with this because they just sold it to me um so so it's yeah so it's almost always a questionable decision because the people making the decision just don't have a background in this Mm -hmm. Um, this is one of the reasons why transformations have such a huge failure rate is just this lack of understanding of how do we make a how do we make a big change like this and then follow through accordingly mm. uh, so it's not a yeah so governing it yeah good luck but there's there's also quite a lot of marketing hype and also this belief in decision makers that i'll never get fired if i hire one of the big five consultancy firms um, yeah. it's the safe choice to make instead of going with this little dingy shop um that that you know they don't even have an office in the city so um and that's it exactly like years ago there used to be like, you don't hear it very often anymore but years ago there used to be a saying you know nobody ever got fired for hiring ibm mm. yeah you know what but they should have been, <laughs> they should have been. <laughs> um because of the lack of governance right yeah and uh, and it's the same thing today you know nobody's getting fired for going with this framework yeah but they should have been <laughs> and they'd be lucky if they were only fired you know but it, it's the nature of the beast right mm-hmm. and um it's gonna happen well personally i'm a lot more interested in redemption um than than criticism Um, because frankly i don't want to get people fired i want to get them to mend their ways and uh, figure out ways to to help each other out because given a choice rather than expressing disdain and frustration i'd rather express respect and appreciation (laughs) right yeah definitely but it's uh, yeah so you're absolutely right but and it's all, and, and that's been my focus um, lately too, right? So DA has been always about, um, you know, how can we help you improve? Mm. And you know, so, mm. yeah, and our, our message for a long time has been, you know, start where you are. So, you, you know, you're currently mm. doing Scrum, great, that's what you're doing. You're currently doing Safe, great, that's what you're doing. You know, we can show you how to improve. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you're, you're having adopted any Agile stuff yet, great, that's what you're doing. We can help you improve. And, and, that I think is is a much better way of working, and because it does respect the fact that you know you have made these decisions, and you know, like, and it, and it's easy. Like I said this earlier, it's it's, re- it's easy to bash the frameworks. It really is, and and people do it. It's good sport and it's fun, um, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And it's and and the fact is, you know, if they've just made a multi million dollar investment in Framework X, <clears throat> go with it, right? It is that's the that's the reality on the ground. Um, okay, fine. Let's make it work and let's get better. And, you know, maybe a few years from now, you'll, you'll be doing something completely different, Mm -hmm. but if you don't accept the fact that that's what you're doing today, um, you're never, you're never going to, you know, move forward. But, uh, but yeah, but there's still a few people I think should be fired. (laughs) (laughs) The, The challenge is the problem isn't the framework. 
The problem, it's not a framework. No. The, the problem is that the framework is just an incidental uh, sort of prop, <laughs> if you will. Um, <clears throat> what I, what well, I see. Yeah, but if, if it's the misapplication of framework, right? Like the frameworks are the frameworks. It's like Scrum is what, what Scrum is. It solves, some, it solves some problems very, very well. Yeah. If you don't have any of those problems, it's you know, it's like using a ha- you know it's like using a hammer to to fix glass. That's I've got right. a scratch. Okay, let's get a hammer. Well, it's a glass. <laughs> it's not gonna work well. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you, you, you need something else other than a hammer to fix that scratch. That's um, right. And That's right. The problem, right? When you, the, the these people don't know how to use the tools, how to use these frameworks, and they because they don't know anything about it, right? So how could they possibly make a choice? and then apply that choice. Um, I think that's the, that's the situation that most organizations are in. They're also not willing to admit to that. Well, the ego is, 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 is sometimes at play. See, that's the thing. Uh, I think uh, we, we've done it to ourselves in that we've made it unsafe to admit to uh, ignorance, to say, I don't know. Um, I need help. Uh, I need some insight here. I'm not sufficiently clever at this. Uh, We've made it so that if I'm a boss, I'm supposed to know everything and tell people what to do, as opposed to uh, it being okay to say, you know what, this one, I have no expertise in. Uh, I don't know. Uh, You tell me, um, what do I need to know? So therefore, uh, I have to appear and therefore, we have this problem of faking that we've, uh, we've discussed. Uh, we have the appearance that everything is fine. See, we have all the documents, as opposed to having the actual expertise and the actual conversation, the actual dialogue, where we don't have to fake anything and we admit uh, to what is actually going on. And that's why I was saying um, the frameworks aren't the problem. They're just a prop. Uh, and people kind of conveniently hide behind them and uh, use terms out of them to excuse uh, traditional typical habits. And therefore, in other words, you've implemented the framework, but you've changed nothing in how you approach things because you've condoned with the terms of the new framework. You've colored by numbers and you say, oh, we're still doing the same thing that didn't quite work. And it's going to continue to still not quite work, not really getting the intention and the essence of what that framework was intended to achieve. So these are the challenges that good oversight we propose needs to address and figure out ways of engaging with people and learn to tell more of the truth, if you will, and learn to make it safe for us to to share in in more of the truth with each other. Exactly. And and build relationships. Like, so one of my you know, favorite tricks is everybody's afraid of the auditors, right? Mm-hmm. Oh no, the evil auditors are, you know, they worship Satan and, you know, whatever it is that they do. And <laughs> you've got to be afraid of the auditors, right? And it's, they're, they're people, you know, go out, you know, go out for coffee or a beer with them and find out about them and, and, and build a relationship with them because they're usually phenomenally frustrated people mm-hmm. and they're just trying to get the job done and help. And, um, and they're not, afraid. and frankly, the auditors are, are, are almost always your best friend. Um, they will like 99 times out of hundred, they're going to get you out of trouble. Um, and, and hopefully better yet help you avoid trouble uh, long before you stumble into it. Right. So, you know, if, if you only had like a process, you know, you know, going back to your original question, if you only had a process auditor um, that, you know, really was really experienced and then someone comes along, Hey, I want to adopt framework X well, time out. <laughs> Really? Have you thought about that one? Um, and, you know, let's talk about this, right? And then let, let's find the right framework for you because it's probably, for, you know, it might be framework Y and not framework X. But until you have that conversation, you'll, you'll never know. But, you know, are you really going to have a, a process auditor on staff? Probably not. But, <laughs> you know, but maybe some organizations will, you know, the bigger ones might. Um, Good. I know Ori is trying to catch up with uh, not taking notes. That's why the the pause. Yeah, is... yeah. You may hear uh, click to clicking uh, in the background. <laughs> we we have a habit of <laughs> of um, capturing the the key thoughts. Now yeah. I'll I'll sort of try and gently bring this uh, towards a close. Um, I'll ask you. Um, what didn't we ask you around this area of oversight and governance that we should have? Oh, great question. Um, I use that one a lot with people. <laughs> um, it's a hard question. Um, I think the, along the line, so, so what do you do? Um, so, you know, what, what if you are a traditional governance person and how do you move to more of a lean, agile 
type of a governance strategy? And um, I think the answer to that would be uh, better collaboration with the teams, right? And, and chances are pretty good. You're completely overwhelmed and, um, you know, you're understaffed, underappreciated, you know, classic, you know, classic governance challenges. And, and probably overwhelmed by regulatory stuff and changes in the, in the environment and changes in strategy. So, you know, COVID the last few years have, have motiv has motivated a lot of companies to um, you know move forward uh, a lot faster on, on their digital transformations and their agile transformations and stuff like that and remote working and all these good things we're all living with right now um, and that that's a huge governance challenge so how do you you know how do you keep an eye on things and 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 lead and motivate um, throughout those times um, so I think so some of it is observe you know, when push came to shove, what did you actually do? And what, you know, what got ignored? And, you know, mm -hmm. what got sidelined? Because you just couldn't do that anymore. You didn't have the time. You didn't, didn't have the bandwidth. Um, so call into question those things that you pushed aside. Um, some of them are very valuable, without a doubt. But a lot of them, I bet you're not. Um, so go after those things and, and, and streamline those and automate the heck out of everything. Um, this is, I can't say that enough. Um, like one of the, one of the really interesting in the, in the financial space, for example, um, you know, one of the big things used to be, uh, well, still is a uh, PCI compliance or, you know, how do you, um, you know, keep an eye, you know, how do you regulate uh, financial transactions? And, you know, it used to be that you would have to, you know, you'd have separation of, you know, it still is, you'd have separation of duties and the developers can't push things into production, you know, um, through their own decisions, somebody else has to keep an eye on that. And it ended up that um, the regulations didn't actually say that. Um, it just said, you know, there had to be a separation of duties, but it didn't mean it had to be a separate person. Um, and then, so, you know, the end result was, as long as we automated that, and, you know, it still wasn't the developer making a decision to push into production, but something else, it didn't have to be a human, as long as something else was making that decision, it was good. So you could automate that and, and then and then and log it and, and have evidence, all this sort of stuff. Um, so that was a very serious um, governance issue years ago. Now, I think all, all the financial institutions have figured this one out, but certainly back you know 10 years ago, this was a major, major issue. Um, and there's stuff like that all over the place. Um, you know, what can you actually automate um, and, you know, either automate completely away um, or, you know, just automate the governance of it and, and have warnings, um, you know, pop up on your, on your governance dashboard, you know, Scott's fooling around again, you know, <laughs> warning, yeah. Uh, so stuff like that, just automate the heck out of everything. Um, so uh, tell us a bit more about uh, what's next on your horizon. What uh, exciting uh, things do you have in mind? Yeah, so I'm uh, hoping to take a, a vacation for the rest of this year. Um, it won't work out that way, but uh, I'm already uh, you know, keynoting at a few conferences and good stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm going to uh, take some time off, figure out what I want to be when I, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up is always a, always a good question to ask yourself. But, uh, and I've got some web, you know, I'm uh, uh, going to be updating some of my older websites and, um, you know, there's some great opportunity to uh, uh, particularly flesh out the Agile data stuff. Um, because as I said earlier, the, um, it's really coming into its own now mm -hmm. and uh, particularly in the data warehousing space. I think the, the um, rate of change, you know, the rate of data and the rate of change is too fast. It's just the traditional techniques have exactly zero chance of working anymore. Um, and I think the, the data community has finally admitted that um, because the, it's just, you can't, you can't model for months and months and months and then, you know, produce an answer at some point, you know, if somebody, you know, if somebody needs data, they need it now, mm. <laughs> you know, they're trying to make a decision now, not, okay, you will get it, you know, six months from now when you, you can update the data, you know, the data report for me. Um, it's just not acceptable anymore. So, even even like a two week you know, a two week sprint is unacceptable in in many cases for for data stuff now. Um, so I think you know we really do need to uh, uh, improve that. And there's uh, you know, all the tools, all the techniques are there. You just have to know how to use them. Mm -hmm.
and post that. Well, Remy, I missed that. Uh, and post post the next six months and the, the data. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Well, well, we'll have to see, right? We'll have to see what you know how, what I what I decide to do when I grow up. But, uh, but yeah, no, I think um, I think there'll be. Uh, uh, I'll probably go back into the data space and 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 uh, and focus on that because because uh, it's fascinating. It was like just absolutely like, um, even doing the exact same thing in different organizations. Like the data is always fascinating when you go into mm. a company mm. and it, it, just the questions they're trying to answer and figure you know things to figure out. Um, you can easily, you know, have a great time uh, doing that for for decades. Uh, so I'm here's a suggestion. Um, uh, you know how the world economy relies much on uh, on shipping. Um, most of the ports around the globe still use the same uh, processes and and tools and bills of lading and so on as hundreds of years ago <laughs> so <laughs> you can make it really really quick you can have a really nicely automated process of shipping things all the way into the port but then the process of getting things through the port and over to the other side it is horrendous right so oh yeah understanding sort of um transportation value streams and how do we deal with as soon as you have ports um, and airports to a certain extent uh, in the mix. Wow, that is a significant data challenge as to how do you streamline that? How do you um, change the process and the data all at the same time such that it's more effective and it flows? Otherwise, ports are always going to continue to be a, um, a strange bottleneck. And particularly now with, uh, with COVID, that's been um, <laughs> remarkably evident, right? So that's a substantial challenge to to address isn't it yeah oh yeah well that healthcare, you know anything in environmental um oh yeah it's just just phenomenal opportunities uh, for improving the data and it's just mm. and the problems are just getting more complex mm. um it's yeah it's it, yeah a lot of very very interesting problems yeah that's the thing right like any one of those problems you know, keep you entertained for the rest of your life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely so. Yeah, because yeah. that's pro that problem's not going to get solved. Over none of those problems are going to get solved overnight, right? So, <laughs> uh, or they would have been a long time ago. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Scott, we would love to invite you uh, for another interview sometime in the future, especially once yeah. you've got your head around this uh, this world of data and and the oversight uh, cap capabilities and challenges in there. We'd love to, to, to continue talking with you about that. Definitely. We'd love, love to be back. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Scott, thank you for your time. Um, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to come and talk to us. Um, we're closing uh, today's session down. And um, yeah, I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a great day.